The last time that we were together, we chatted about the Eastern churches. We began the discussion on that. And we spoke about their antiquity. In fact, some of them go back before the Church of Rome. They were where the earliest um, apostles went, to places like Antioch and to Alexandria. And it was only a little bit later that the church actually spread further uh, to the west and went to North Africa and to Italy and then continued on into Spain. So I think that, you know, the point I was really trying to make last week was that it is all part of the church, the 22 churches, even though the one church, the Latin church, is so much larger in numbers and, and in presence and all, that the council clearly said that all the churches were equal in dignity, equal in, the, uh, in their heritage, and that all of that diversity attests to the value of the unity that in God's plan, there is room for different uh, ways of, you know, of living the Catholic faith. And so today I want to move on in that same vein. And we come to something, remember I said last week, what determines our membership are three things, the same faith, the sacraments, and governance. And I want to chat a bit about sacraments because the Eastern churches and the you know, and the Latin church have the same seven sacraments. And yet, and yet there are some significant uh, differences. For example, in the earliest church, when someone became a follower of Jesus, they were baptized, they were confirmed, and they made their first Holy Communion. That was the order of the sacraments of initiation. As time went on, the church developed in different ways. And in the West, they developed with very significant numbers of people becoming members of the church. And the sacraments of initiation initially were done by the bishop with the help of priests. What do I mean? You would have a group for baptism. The priests, either on their own or with the bishop, would baptize, but the, but the bishop would be the one to confirm. And then the, the mass would continue, and the bishop would be the principal celebrant, and at communion time, you know, priests and bishop would distribute the Holy Eucharist. Well, what happened in the West, you and I, was that because of the large numbers of people, the bishop could not be everywhere. And so the way it was done in the West was that either infants or adults were baptized, and then confirmation was done when the bishop came and Later on, they made their first communion. Today, uh, and the East kept the three together, baptism, confirmation, and holy communion, and allowed the priests to fully initiate people. And so you had two different developments of, of how those sacraments were uh, celebrated. The important thing is that those three sacraments were identical, the East and the West, and the three of them together were the sacraments of initiation. In other ways, for example, the sacrament of penance. The sacrament of penance basically developed the same way. Uh, the East had penance, the priests heard confessions. There was more of a mystical 
spiritual uh, sense. In the West, it became more juridical in the way it was looked at. But the same thing. A person confessed, they expressed sorrow, they received absolution, and they had a penance. The four elements of penance, the sacrament of penance, have been part of the celebration of the church from the early times in both the East and the West. The sacrament of marriage, it develops a little bit differently, but again, the church is big enough that what we have today, for example, is in the West, uh, you know, now, uh, you know, the West says that, uh, that the couple marry themselves. And the priest is there as an official witness of the church. And then there are those two other two witnesses, you know, the best man and the maid of honor. But the priest is the one who is a witness, the couple are the ones who actually bring about the marriage by marrying themselves to the other, a party. In the East, however, it is the blessing of the priest that brings about the marriage. Now, the people are there to get married and all that, but the actual bringing about the sacrament is the blessing of the priest. So that we have a, you know, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, times when this becomes a bit, you know, of a challenge because the Eastern person, for example, uh, is marrying a non-Catholic, okay, a Presbyterian. The Eastern person, you know, is a uh, you know, goes to a Latin church, our church, because there are no Coptic churches around. So here you have an Easterner, you know, an Easterner marrying a non-Catholic. The, you know, the Latin pastor has jurisdiction because the bishop does, but the couple is going to be married by a deacon. And it's supposed to be the blessing of the priest for that non, you know, for that uh, Catholic Easterner. Marriage becomes, you know, and, and the folks here from the tribunal deal with these things regularly that there are nuances when you have a marriage. The sacraments of initiation are much more straightforward, as is, uh, you know, confession, anointing of the sick. Holy orders, it's the same. One major difference, not in, you know, it's uh, deacons, priests, and bishops, but in the East, men are able to be married before they are ordained. When we hear this, that in the Catholic Church, priests don't get married, well, that's not accurately stated. You know, men in the Latin Church, you and I, the, those of us who are priests here today, you know, we're all Latins. When we, you know, desire to follow a call to the priesthood, um, it was with the promise of celibacy. In the East, the priests, uh, the men can get married and get uh, ordained afterwards. They cannot be married after they're ordained. They get married before they're ordained. So a, a, another a difference, but still it's the same sacrament. It's forever and it is unrepeatable. So those important elements are still there, are still very much part of the same teaching with a disciplinary difference that before ordination 
an Eastern man can be married. And with that marriage, then, you know, uh, be ordained a uh, priest. And the sacrament of anointing the sick is very much, you know, the same. You know, in, in dangers of death, serious illness, the East and uh, churches have the same sacraments, same seven sacraments. Now, we as Latins, can we go to those uh, churches, those parishes? We certainly can. Why? Because they're Catholic. Can we receive sacraments from those Eastern priests? We certainly can. We can go to confession. We can go to Mass there. We can receive the Holy Eucharist. The one that gets a little bit, you know, because of the rules is marriage. That each one of them has to be looked at and analyzed on its own, you know, because it involves not only an Eastern Catholic person, but also someone else. <laughs> and who is the someone else and what is their background? So that m many of those things can be taken care of, but there is uh, the need to look at it, you know, very carefully. The church in that document, the decree on the Eastern churches, very highly um, charges the Eastern Catholics with the duty and responsibility of working towards union with the non-Catholic churches. Now I have deliberately not talked much about that because it can become confusing, but you have Greek Orthodox, you have Greek Catholics. You have Russian Orthodox, you have Russian Catholics. Almost all of the non-Catholic churches have a Catholic counterpart, but not all of them. But the majority have a Catholic counterpart. So, what happens in life? Oftentimes, you find that in a family, some of the people in the family have remained Greek Orthodox and some have become Greek Catholic. And the church is saying to the Greek Catholics the Greek, uh, and the Russian Catholics, work with those who have the same heritage, the same history, work with them to try to bring unity. Now we're all supposed to be working for unity, but in a very special way the church looks to the Eastern Catholic to take on that responsibility to help bring together, because so often there are family ties, there are ties that also bring them together from what part of a country they came from, and so on. So that there's already some bonds, some further bonds of, of uh, you know, togetherness. And the church is saying, work towards the same with respect to the religious affiliation. That is a major um, you know, issue because the Orthodox are saying, and the other non-Catholics, you know, I mean, we're authentic. So why are you trying to, you know, to proselytize us? So there's all kinds of sensitivities. And you see this with some frequency in the newspaper about the, um, you know, the misunderstandings and all of that that happens uh, among the Eastern Christians. Eastern Christians is a title that embraces both groups, Eastern Catholics and Catholics. They're all Christian, and they have great similarities, but there's also very real differences. So that's something that, you know, like in Parma, for example, there is a Ukrainian Catholic diocese. And in Parma, there's a Ukrainian Orthodox diocese. The Ukrainian church over the centuries 
Some have been outside of communion with Rome and some have been in union with Rome. And sometimes in those two divisions, you know, I, I mean, it's a sister in one and a brother in the other. And they're married and they have children and, you know, and they have the same family parties and everything else. And right now in part of the East, they're working very much on bringing together in those churches where there's such familiarity and similarities, a common Easter to try to bring that about. Because that's something that, as we know, you know, uh, this year I think that the Eastern celebration of Easter is four or five weeks after the Latin church. And we're not going to get into how they figure that out. Um, I just said a moment ago the similarities and how close, you know, the, the Eastern non-Catholics are to us. When they become a Catholic, all the church requires is that they make a profession of faith. You know, they don't certainly put them through the RCIA program because they're Christians. You know, so the, you don't go through the RCIA program. And they're not treated the same way as Christians from the West. Christians from the West would, depending on the circumstances and all, many of them would, by affiliation, be part of the RCIA uh, process. But in the East, the Eastern separated Christians, only a profession of faith. And yet, we have the interesting thing that in this document, in paragraph four, it says that when a separated Christian of the East becomes a Catholic, they are to go into the same church that is the counterpart of the Greek Orthodox. So a Greek Orthodox person coming into the Catholic Church becomes a member of the Greek Catholic Church. Now, around here, people, if they're going to become a Catholic, they want to join the Latin Church. But the law says, it's one of the few laws that actually came out of the Second Vatican Council, that they are to go into the counterpart that I spoke about a few moments ago. There is a mechanism whereby we do this. There's a couple, a man and a woman, who are unmarried. Both of them are from the, uh, from the Byzantine church that uh, is in communion with the Roman church. And they want to uh, become uh, you know, married and they want to be Latins because they've been going uh, to a Catholic parish now for quite a while. I wrote a letter to the bishop in Parma. He wrote back and said, you know, the two of them have my permission to become Catholic. I have another case where we have a Russian Orthodox wanting to marry a non-Catholic, and they are uh, presently trying to become a Catholic because they've been going to a Catholic church for quite a while. There's no Russian Catholic bishop in the United States. So I was advised by Washington, write to Rome, and it came back in three weeks, granting permission that when he is received into the church, he can be received as a Latin Catholic. These things become you know, somewhat important because it's a, a person's spiritual life. So, the vast majority of the bishops cooperate from the Latin church to the Eastern churches and vice versa because it's not so much the numbers, but you don't want to frustrate people's practice where they find a spiritual wholeness in a way that you know, speaks to their heart. So those kind of things are things that I wanted to, um, you know, to... Uh, you know, to continue, the last point I want to make is periodically we have a, 
a uh, separated Eastern priest becomes a Catholic. He is then a Catholic priest. Why? Because his ordination was valid. This is something that in a couple of weeks we'll come across, but from a different point of view, when we talk about the decree on ecumenism. But the important thing is that in the East, in the East, they are called churches for many reasons, but not least of which, their bishops and their priests are validly ordained. That's why you and I can receive communion in their church. Because there's a valid ordination. When we talk, <clears throat> when we get to ecumenism in a couple of weeks, we're going to find that that is not the Catholic position when it comes to Lutherans, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, and so on. That is not a valid ordination. And therefore, if it's not a valid ordination, then, you know, when they celebrate Mass or, or whatever, you know, I, I have a Eucharist or a you know, or whatever, it, we would not see that as being the body and blood of Christ. It's all hinged on the validity of the ordination. And the Eastern, is, the Eastern Christians, whether or not they're Catholic or Orthodox, their ordinations are valid. And that makes the big difference why we're so close to them and not as close with others on many levels.